to the uh, to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to read verse 11. Then we're going to stand up and make our declaration before we get into God's word this morning. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12, verse 11. The Bible says here, And they, the people of God, overcame him, the adversary, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. You know, we see in this verse, verse 11, and again, it's familiar to all of us, but just as a way of reminder, Two very important keys here for us to be overcomers. It says they overcame the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their test. That means they, so there are two things. The blood of the lamb, that's what, that's God's side. That's what God provided for us. There's nothing that we have to do with it. Jesus Christ died. He made his blood available by the blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony, that's our part. We testify to what the blood of the Lamb has done for us. So God has provided the atonement, the redemption, whatever Christ has done for us on the cross. And now we testify to it. They overcame him, the adversary, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. So they are testifying, we are testifying to what the blood of the Lamb has done for us. And that puts us in that position of living as overcomers, of experiencing overcoming victory, triumph in our lives. And so it's so important for us to uh, say with our mouth what the blood of the Lamb, what God has done for us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. To say with our mouth. So sometimes you just have to do it intentionally. Don't wait for something difficult to happen to say. You just do it on purpose. Devil, I want to harm you today. Just listen to all that the blood of Jesus has done for me. And then you say, the blood of Jesus cleansed me from every sin. The blood of Jesus redeemed me. The blood of Jesus protects me, covers me. The blood of Jesus brought me into this eternal covenant with God. God is for me. You, know, you declare everything that I have been delivered from the powers of darkness. I've been translated into God's own kingdom. That I've been purchased Spirit, soul, and body. I'm God's property. The devil has no right, no claim, no access over my life. So you begin to declare, you testify to what has happened in your life because of the blood of Jesus. And it makes you the overcomer that God has designed you and me to be. Amen? So let's rise to our feet right now. We're going to be intentional about this. We're going to purposely say what God has said about us because we believe it. So let's lift our Bibles high up in the air. Let's say this out loud, bold and strong. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of his blessing to many people. I receive his word. I believe his word. And I live by his word. Christ is my master. And to him, I am an absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Why don't you turn, turn around to the people next to you, shake hands. Give them a smile. Give them your name. Say hello. And uh, then you may be seated, please. Two weeks ago, we had our Christian Leaders Conference, uh, which we do every year in Bangalore. Uh, as we start out the conferences around the country, we start off always with Bangalore. Uh, so we had our Christian Leaders Conference in Bangalore. We brought in all our outreach pastors and others with us. Uh, uh, this year we did this conference on the gift of the Holy Spirit, just talking and sharing about the gifts. So it was three days. And uh, then we had people in the, you know, who are, uh, are attending to step out and, and step out on the gifts and so on. And um, I just want to share a few th things here. Or I think it was the third day. Um, 
we saw some God do some amazing things. There was this lady who, and I think you saw the testimony in the video last Sunday, but for, the, for those of you who missed it, uh, she had had an injury, an accident, and then she had, you know, a lot of uh, medical work done. She was cared for and so on. But at the end of it all, one leg was shorter than the other. She had a limp, right? And during one of the sessions, I think it was the third day, we had people praying groups, and there were four to a group. So there were four people praying for this lady, and her leg grew out. Her leg grew out, and she could walk without a limp, okay? Now, uh, she's the best person to say that, okay? She told us. She walked around, tested everything, and she said she was walking without a limb. And there was another man uh, who had uh, a similar condition, and he also came forward to testify that he was able to walk with a limb. Another healing that we saw at the same time during that prayer time was uh, there was this guy who had come down from Varanasi. He had attended a Bible college there, and so he's come down here. And I think his testimony was also on the, on the video last Sunday. He had an uh, accident and he injured his right hand to the point where after everything was healed, he could only turn his hand so much. He couldn't turn any further. I mean, he was healed, but there was this restricted motion in his hand. So when they were praying for him, God healed him, and he was so excited he, could, he had restored full mobility in his arm. He could move his hand. He was so excited. Uh, about what God had done. Now, he was not lying to us. He, he had nothing to gain from all of that, right? So, that was just another amazing thing. Now, another amazing testament, which was very amazing, surprising to me, was, okay, there was another lady who was, uh, was actually seated here, or I won't point her out, but uh, she shared this testimony where one of her feet was shorter than the other. So, we understand legs shorter than the other, but the size of her feet one was smaller than the other. All right? And so when she had to buy shoes, she had to buy two different sizes. Oh, slippers. Two different sizes. And she was prayed for, and she testified that her feet became same size. Okay? Now, I don't know how that works, but she knows it, not me, right? And I can only look at her feet and say, yeah, they look fine. But she knows she was spent all her life that way. She testified of what God had done. Okay. So that particular session, we're actually praying for miracles. We're just praying, God, we want miracles to happen. So we went specifically after these kinds of miracles, the bones, these kinds of things. And God took them, and they were just groups of people, four, 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 just praying for different ones that needed uh, uh, some sort of a healing, some sort of work done in their bodies. And right there in that hall, we had these things happening. Amen. So I just felt we'd take a few moments before we get into God's Word just to pray for people who've got problems with bones, okay? Uh, something wrong with your bone, uh, whether it's, you know, one bone shorter, or something that needs to be done, whether it's not been healed properly, not been set properly, uh, maybe you got a little finger that's not its proper size, you need it to grow, you want it to grow out, uh, whatever, anything that has to do with, uh, you know, uh, Proud that you want God to heal, especially the bones. We're going to pray. Is it okay? So, why don't we all just stand up to our feet? And we're going to pray. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if this is not part of the order of service. It's okay. <laughs> God wants to do something. Let God do it. And I share those testimonies just to share with you that, see, God is real. God is so powerful. He, Jesus is so real. The, the same Jesus of the Bible is alive today. Okay? He didn't graduate through seminary. So, or, all right. Sorry for saying that. But. <laughs> The point is, he's still the miracle-working Jesus. He hasn't changed. Amen? He's still the Jesus of the Bible. And, 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 and we just have to believe him for that. And so right here, right now, we want him to just touch and heal people who've got problems. Some problem with your bones. You know, maybe you had a fracture, you had an injury, it's not been healed properly. Or like you heard about, you know, maybe there's a one arm is shorter than the other. You need to grow it, have it grown out, or your spine has been, vertebrae has been damaged, discs have been damaged, or I don't know, just whatever, right? So if you need just pray, I'm going to pray from here. I just want you to lift up your hand and ask people around you if they don't mind, just come to lay hands on you, pray. Remember, at the end of the day, it's not about who's praying, but it's about Jesus who's the healer, right? So don't look at me or don't look at the person who's laying hands on you. Just look to Jesus, all right? 
So if you need prayer for anything like that, just put your hand up. And we're going to have, take a few moments to pray. So just put your hand up. I'm going to ask people around you who believe just to come lay, stand next to you, pray with you. All right? So anything to do with the bones or any, uh, you know, any healing that's needed with the bones, just lift your hand up. And others, please step out. Just go pray with them. You know, Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Let's expect, let's believe God for instantaneous healing right now. As soon as we finish praying, we want to see healings, we want to see miracles. And God's more than able to do that right now. So just stand next to these people if you can, if you don't mind. I'm going to pray. Others with their hands raised up, just come on. I need. We need some people up in the balcony. Just move around. Just make sure every person with a hand up uh, has somebody with them praying for them. Okay? So if you have somebody praying for you, then, uh, okay, we, we need somebody right here as well. Come on, Sanjay, if you don't mind. Uh, as soon as you have somebody with you, then you can put your hands down. So if you don't have anybody standing next to you to pray for you, then uh, just have your hand up. And make sure somebody comes to you, okay? We've got everyone covered. So those standing next to the person, ask them, what is it about? Uh, uh, if you want, you have two people praying for the same person, that's a perfectly fine. Ask them, what's it about? And then you're going to pray a simple prayer. So in Jesus' name, I command that, whatever that condition is, to be healed. All right? Okay, go ahead. Just do that. And I'll pray from here. Jesus, we worship you. You're the God of miracles. You're the God who heals even today. So right now, right now, Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I command the bones to be healed. Vertebrae, discs, command you to be healed. Joints, I command you to be healed. Bones that have been damaged, I command you to be made straight, made whole, be set properly. I command the bones to be healed. In the name of Jesus, let the miracle working power of God right now cause healing. In Jesus' name. Let there be a complete work of healing taking place in your body in the name of Jesus. Let there be a visible change right now in Jesus' name. Let all the pain, all the discomfort, all the limitations, all the limitations of mobility, let all be gone. Let complete restoration, let there be complete restoration of mobility in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, take a moment to check. Again, we don't want to put any pressure on you to come to testify or anything. I've done something right now. Just check if that pain was there or not. It's gone. Some very often things just happen right then while we pray. So just check. And if you find something visibly different, notably different, noticeably different, then put your hand up. Something happened right now while we're praying, something noticeably different. Again, no pressure to testify. But if you find something notably different, noticeably different, put your hand up so we can acknowledge that. Anyone here? Something happened right now. Okay, I don't see any hand. Anyone? Okay, that, never mind. Just God bless you. Why don't we all be seated? All right? Doesn't matter if you haven't seen anything right now. We will get testimony. So... And you go home, you check, you're perfectly fine. Please share your testimony. Send an email uh, or you can text me. Just share your testimony so that we could share that with others. Amen? All right. This morning, it's going to be a short sermon, a simple sermon. Uh, this month of January, we've been just uh, bringing a few motivational messages uh, to us just to get us ready for 2018, for what lies up ahead. So this morning, I just, want, I just want to borrow my title from the sports world. I want to title this message, Raising Your Game. So turn, turn around to the person, somebody next to you, and say, Raise Your Game. All right. If there's somebody on the other side, tell them as well, Raise Your Game. All right. So what does this mean? You know, let's imagine if there are two sporting teams, whether they're soccer teams, you know, or cricket teams or whatever. Uh, they're going to the tournament. They've beat every other team. They've come to the finals. Now, when they come into the finals, the final game, the final match, they can't just come in and say, hey, we've beat everyone else and we're automatically going to win. You can't come with that mindset. You've got to come into the final game saying, yeah, we've beat the others, but the other team has also beat all their opponents. We've got to raise our 
game. I mean, we got to take our game up to a new level if we are going to win the final match. Now, you can't just come in casually, right? So, raising your game, and we basically, when you're talking about raising your game, we're just talking about how you and I can make an effort to improve the way we are doing something, right? How can you and I improve? How can you and I grow? How can you and I increase? How can you and I do something that we are doing, but do it better so that you and I can see better outcomes? The reason I'm speaking in generalities is because for each one of us, raising our game may be a little different. As if I were a student, for me, raising my game may be doing better uh, in my learning, learning some new things, uh, doing better in my grades, uh, doing better in school. Uh, if I'm a, if I were a professional working, uh, you know, maybe doing sales or that kind of work, maybe raising my game to me may mean may mean uh, I, I do better in, in sales. I do better in whatever I'm doing, or as a IT professional, or as a teacher, an educator. So. What that actually would mean to each one of us would be different. But the point is, we've all got to look for ways on how we can improve what we're doing so that we can improve outcomes. We can raise our game. You with me so far? Right. Now, I want to just share three simple things from Scripture that you and I can apply uh, to our lives as we seek to raise our game. So it's not very complicated, not very long message. And, and the reason I'm putting it out before us here in January is so that as you progress through 2018, be intentional about your journey through this year. You know, don't just go through the year. At the end of the year, you come back and say, hmm, what actually happened? <laughs> you know, what did I do in 2018? Uh, oh, I'm at the same level. I'm playing the same kind of game. Uh, uh, nothing really has changed significantly. It shouldn't be that way. Whatever you're doing, at the end of 2018, when you come to the close of the year, you should be able to look back and say, you know, I've really seen things improve. I've seen growth. I've seen increase in, in various areas of my life. And I'm so happy in the way I've journeyed through this year. So that's the intention. So number one, it's very really simple, but yet I think sometimes we forget to do this. And it is to ask God for increase. Ask God for growth. Ask God for improvement. Ask God saying, God, I want to be in a better place. Now, sometimes we just forget to do it. Now, we are so busy. January 3rd has come and we are back to work. You're so busy with doing what you're doing. You've forgotten, hey, that I can actually pause, look at my life and talk to God about my life and say, God, there are these certain areas of my life where I really want to improve. I don't want to stay where I am. And we forget sometimes to do that. Or in some, for some of us, we just feel bad about asking God. Maybe we think, you know, God may not be really interested in me improving. Or sometimes we get very theological about it. Maybe God wants me to stay where I am in order to keep me humble. Right? So... He's actually, this year, he's going to make things worse for me so that I can be a little bit more humble. Now, so sometimes we've got all these mindsets. We've got all these wrong ideas. And so sometimes we just intentionally need to put them aside with the word of God and have the courage, the boldness to say, God, I need to improve so that you can be glorified, so that I can be a blessing to people, so that I can help people glorify the name of Jesus Christ in my life. I want to point. I want to point us to just two passages of scripture this morning, and just to motivate us. The first one we're going to look at is the prayer of Jabez in First Chronicles chapter four, verses nine to, and ten. Verse nine says, "Now Jabez was much more honorable than his brothers. He did something better than his brothers. He raised his game. You want to say it that way? Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called him." Is his name Jabez saying, because I bore him in pain. Now, Jabez didn't have a very great start. In the Old Testament, to the people there in those days, name meant a lot. Your, your name described your, was essentially your identity. 
It describes your nature, your character, what your parents hoped that you would become, what you would bring into this world. So can you imagine that you grow up and you realize your mother has called you, uh, given you a name that simply means somebody who causes pain. Jabez. Oh no, what a name. <laughs> Is that my identity? Is that what I'm about to do in life, cause people pain? You know, that's a descriptor of who I am, what I'm about to achieve or accomplish in life. Somebody causes pain. Not a very good start. But here's what Jabez did. Verse 10 says, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And God granted him his request. Now think about what Jabez did. He prayed. And he asked God, God, I want you to bless me. I want you to enlarge my territory. That simply means, God, give me lots of land. Because in those days... Success was determined by how much land you had, how much possessions, herds and flock and cattle and all of that. So he prayed for that. God, give me lots of land. Bless me. You enlarge my territory. God, keep me from evil and keep me from causing others pain. This, God, change everything. Whatever my mother has spoken over my life, for whatever reason she did it, that's okay. But you are God who can change everything. Amen? He prayed like that. And so I want to encourage you and I. We too can pray like that. And notice what the, what the Bible says. God granted him his request. God didn't say, hey, Jabez, sorry. That's your lot in life. See you in heaven. <laughs> It'll be better here, Jabez. Just, just endure through it. God didn't say, Jabez... That's not the right kind of prayer to pray. He didn't say that. It says God granted him his. Now, what is your situation? What is your starting point at this moment? Maybe there are many negatives. Jabez had his own. You may have your own. I may have my own. But yet, we can pray. We can pray. And say, God, you bless me. You enlarge my territory. You give me increase. You give me growth. You help me raise my game. You help me do better through 2018 than I've done in 2017. Maybe I've had some setbacks. Maybe I've had some discouragements in 2017, whatever. But God, as I'm starting out 2018, you increase me. You bless me. You enlarge my territory. You make sure I'm a blessing to my organization. You make sure I'm a blessing, you know, whatever I'm doing, that that will prosper. And the motivation is, God, I want you to be glorified. And I want just to bless. I want to you know, do something meaningful. I want to bless people. I want to be able to serve people. That's the motivation. It's not something selfish. But it's to bless. So you can pray. God help me raise my game. I want to bring us to another passage in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 to 8. And this is about King David. It's at this time in his life when he's done really well. And he's, he's king over Israel, king over Judah. Uh, he's won many of his battles. Uh, he's well established now. Everything has gone great and uh, at that moment. And then unfor something unfortunate happens. He sins. And he's, he's done this wrong thing against God. And God sends prophet Nathan to bring correction to David. But I want us to look at those words that prophet Nathan is speaking to King David at that juncture in his life. And he's actually bringing correction and see the heart of God. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, it, Nathan says, it says, Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little... I also would have given you much 
glory. Think about the heart of God. What does God say? David, I did all this for you. I took you from being a shepherd. I made you king. I gave you all this. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. David, I was more than ready to give you much. Think about the heart of God. So God is not, not like as some of us, you know, as we say in our language, God is not conjus. <laughs> He's not miserly, right? He is ready to give us much more. But our picture of God has to change. We think God is this stingy God. Which is, you know, last year I gave you two. Don't ask me for three this year. But God is saying, David, I've done all this for you. And if that had been too little, if you felt that wasn't enough, I would be willing, would have been willing to give you much. God is a God of much more. We need to understand God's heart. But David, not this. Don't sin. Don't go against my heart. Right. So God is giving, willing. If God was to speak to you, you'd probably say the same thing. Say, look, I'm willing to give you much more. Or I'll do it. Let's do it the right way. Let's take the right journey. Let's take the right path. I'm willing to bring you into a place of much. All right. Thank you so much. So on the very, you know, very initial service, we stood before that little group, people. And we said, our vision is to have a church with 50,000 people. Right? And they're like, this guy's crazy. These people are crazy. <laughs> And then we said, we want to have five locations with 50,000. So not one location. We need five. With 50,000 people, because the city is so big, uh, you know, we can't expect everybody to come to the same location. And if you saw, if you've seen the 2031 plan, it's like the city is getting even bigger. Okay. I, I, I forget the number of districts. They've broken in like 38 or 48 districts. And the city, the plan is just, Huge for the city. Uh, so the, the population of the city is only going to get more. The city is going to get wider, which means it's like to go from one end of the city to the other is going to take you short of eternity <laughs> with all the traffic. All right? So we may have helicopter service and all that happening. But anyway, but the point is we, we said we're going to have five locations, 50,000 each. That's the vision we're going to go after. Now, We've journeyed so far and be thankful for everything that's happened and, you know, for the lives that have been blessed. And, of course, one thing about our church is that uh, there's this constant move of people uh, just going overseas. And, uh, like, we probably can plant more churches overseas <laughs> with all the people who have gone abroad uh, than, you know, uh, the, the, the people who are left behind here. Uh, so, and, uh, but in one way, it's good because we've, we've equipped them, trained them, and they can be a blessing uh, whichever part of the world they've gone to. But here's what I want us to do. And that we, at those of us who are at Central, we need to begin to say, God, we want our church to enlarge. We're asking for increase. Go after that. I need to go after that collectively. Right? I can pray alone, but it's great when we do it together. Right? And remember, you know, sometimes people say, oh, why are you in the numbers game? And I, you know, young children wrote this book a long time ago, more than numbers. It's not about numbers. But it's about people who need to get saved. People for whom Jesus died. If we have 12 million people in our city, it is absolutely wrong to say we'll be happy to be this little group of 20 people or 30 people. Hey, when you have 12 million people who need to be saved. That's not the right way to think. The right way to think is, God, there are 12 million people in our city or more who need Jesus. We're going to do everything we can to reach them with the gospel. That's what motivates us. Amen. And with that motivating us, we begin to pray and say, God, we want to see this attendance here, the adult church attendance here at Central. I said something different. I set a different goal for our West Church this morning, the 8 o'clock service. But now for us at Central, as a first step, we say, God, we want to see at least 600 adults worshiping every Sunday. So we are now on an average doing about 450, but we want to see 600. 
That means every Sunday, right? That's the attendance. Then God, we want to move. We keep pushing that up. 700. So my, the goal is like this. By June 1st, we want to see 600 adults worshiping here every Sunday. By December 1st, what can we make that? Uh, thousands? Okay. All right, let's be a little modest. Let's do it 800. Okay. 600 by June 1st. 800 by December. Next year, we'll take bigger steps. Okay. But let's ask God intentionally. God, enlarge our territory. Bless us, enlarge us. I want to just read for you, Yonggi Cho. One of the earliest books I read as a teenager was the books by Yonggi Cho. Now, many of you know the story of Yonggi Cho, pastor of the world's largest church. And this, you know, in the, in the 80s, when his books were written and came out uh, in the early 80s, it was amazing to read his story and how he made that journey. I'm just reading uh, uh, an example. up to you from one of his earliest books. It was called The Fourth Dimension. You can still get it. and uh, It's really inspiring. But he shares his own journey. So basically, Yonggi Cho was a 19-year-old Korean boy in Seoul, Korea, dying of tuberculosis, given up uh, uh, by the doctors. He was going to die. He was in his final stages of life as a 19-year-old. And at that time, uh, a missionary girl, lady, who used to teach Sunday school, came and shared Jesus with him. So he heard about Jesus, he believed in Jesus, and the Lord healed him completely from his tuberculosis. He was back on his feet, and then shortly after that, he, he, he started serving the Lord. So I'll just read something, I'll read a, few, uh, a little excerpt here from his book, The Fourth Dimension. So he says, when I started my ministry in 1958, I had a burning desire in my soul to build the largest church in Korea. It was a goal that I desired so much that it burned in my soul. It was burning in me so steadily that I was living with it, sleeping with it, and walking with it all the time. So you had this burning passion inside him. I'm skipping a few paragraphs here. I'm just picking up something else here. And this is what he says when he talks about you know, asking God for increase. Here's how he did it. So he writes, do not just say, oh, God, bless me, bless me. Do you know how many blessings the Bible has? There are 8,000 promises. So if you say, oh, God, bless me, then God would ask you, out of the 8,000 promises, what kind of blessing do you want? Though he knows your heart, the Bible says you must ask, ask and it shall be given you, Matthew 7, verse 7. And this includes asking specifically. So be very definite. Take out your notebook, write it down, see it clearly. I always ask God to give revival to my church. And I ask according to a definite number. Now, this is he sharing his own journey. In 1960, I began to pray, God give us 1,000 more members each year. And until 1969, that's for over nine years, 1,000 members were added to my church each and every year. But in 1969, I changed my mind and thought, if God could give 1,000 members per year, why shouldn't I ask God to give 1,000 members per month? So since 1979, I started praying, Father, give us 1,000 members per month. At first, God gave 600 then began to give more than 1,000 per month. In one year, we received 12,000 new members in our church. Then I increased my goal, and we had 15,000 additional members by the end of that year. The following year, I asked for 20,000 more members. If you have a definite request you want to place before the Lord in prayer, if you can really see it, then you will have faith to receive it. Amen? Now, God has no respect for persons. If he did something like that through Yonggi Cho there, he can do it through you and me here. Amen? And we don't have to take that, a bigger jump. Let's take a small jump first. Right? A small jump. Lord, by June 1st, 2018, we want 600 people who worship here every Sunday in this auditorium. Adults. Small jump. 452, 600. That's it. And 
Once we hit that goal, then by the, in the next six months, we want to just increase by 200. Say, God, we want to see 800 people. Right? By December. Is it okay? Can we all agree together on that? Small numbers, okay? But then if we can do that this year, then 2019, we can stretch. Right? And maybe someday we'll be praying with 20,000 members like Young Issue. But for now, let's do small numbers. Is that okay? So ask God for increase. Ask him specifically. When you pray for Central, God, we want to see 600 people coming in every Sunday morning, adults coming in every Sunday morning, worshiping you here. We want to see that and bring people in. We want to see them get saved, get them healed and delivered and just following Jesus, disciple and following Jesus. We want to pray for that. And so let's go after that intentionally. All right, let's get back to our message. Raising your game. Number two, sharpen your skills. So tell, tell your neighbor, sharpen your skills. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. Be familiar with this verse. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. Now this is drawing an example from the old days when they used to use the axe to cut wood or chop a tree. Obviously, if you had a blunt edge, you have to use that much more strength to get the job done. But the wiser thing to do is just sharpen the edge. You'll get the job done easily. How do you and I apply that to our lives? Sharpen your skills in whatever you do, whatever you're doing. Professionally, you know, maybe keep up with technology if, if that's your area of work. Do some courses online. Begin to enhance your skills. Get into what's happening on the cutting edge, so on and so forth. Maybe that might be one area. Some of us are educators, so maybe you enhance what you do as an educator. Um, some of us may be working in other areas, other industries. But whatever you need, how this applies to you, sharpen the edge of your axe. Whatever that means to you. Stop using a blunt edge. It's just going to take more of your time and energy. Amen? Some of you may have heard the story of Peter Daniels. Uh, he's about 85 or 80. Uh, yeah, he's about 85 now. So that means he was born 1932 in Adelaide, Australia. And uh, you could read his story online. But I think it's an amazing story because uh, he ha he, he, his, his beginnings were very, very pathetic, meaning very sad. He was born into a family where they were third generation living on welfare. Because they had no money of their own. Government was taking care of them. Third generation, three generations living like that. He, two of his brothers were alcoholics. Many of his family members in prison. He had, I forget how many fathers, how many mothers, but he had four fathers and two mothers. I mean, the family was so messed up. He didn't pass school. He failed his exams. So here he was as, as a 26-year-old man. 26. Illiterate. Didn't know how to read and write properly. 26. Working as a bricklayer, a mason, bricklayer. Now, we would have written him off saying, okay, nothing's going to mount to his life. And, you know, maybe he's going to end up in prison or something like that. Just look at, look at everything that's happening around him. But here's what he did. Very inspiring story. 26 years of age with all of this background, all these struggles and baggage, working as a bricklayer. With the money he earned, he bought a few dictionaries. And he started learning English by reading dictionaries. No school would accept him, so... He would stop people and have them help him read the words in the dictionary, how to read it correctly, how to pronounce it correctly. So he learned English. Now he could never go to any college. But here's what he did. With the money he was earning, he bought 6,000 biographies 
of people who were successful in life. And he read their stories. What made them successful? But before he could get on this journey, I forgot to mention one thing. At the age of 26, he attended a Billy Graham crusade. And he gave his heart to Jesus. That's the most significant thing. So while he was in this really difficult situation in life, he encountered Jesus at a Billy Graham crusade. Gave his heart to Jesus. And he believed that God could help him. And so he began this way. Read dictionaries to learn English. Then he read, bought these biographies, started reading about all these people who became successful, just reading, reading. And then he was so inspired, he started three businesses. All three businesses failed. But he didn't give up. Today, I mean, shortly thereafter, and now it's a long success story, 85 years old. But eventually what happened to him, he became a multi-millionaire. He created several successful businesses. Real, he was in real estate, business in Australia, Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, he actually set up their own bank that deals with gold uh, and several other businesses. He became so successful, and he is so successful. It's like, if you have an estimation, you need some milestones, and you need to make the journey across those milestones. Are you with me? Don't just go where life takes you. You go where God wants you to go. But not only go where God wants you to go, you need to ponder the path you free. God said, I will lead you and teach you the way you should go. That means our responsibility is I listen to God and I, I make my journey in the direction He wants me to go. So, in order to ponder the path of your feet, you and I need to set and pursue goals. And again, this is common knowledge, but I'm just bringing it here uh, for, for the benefit of some of us. When you set goals, always set SMART goals. Okay, so the word SMART is an acronym. And uh, how do you know a goal is a smart goal when it is specific, when it's measurable, when it's achievable or attainable, when it's relevant, and when it is time bound? So that's a smart goal. So let's take this for your spiritual life. For your spiritual growth. That's a smart goal. So you want to grow spiritually. What are some things you can do? Here's one. You can set a goal. Read one good Christian book every month. That's a smart goal. It's specific. Read a book. It's measurable. One book. It's attainable. You're reading 20 books. One book is doable for most of us. Some of us can do two books, some of us can do three books. But one book is very attainable, achievable for many of us. It's relevant, Christian book. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to grow spiritually, you set a goal. I'm going to read one good Christian book. It's relevant to your goal. You want to grow spiritually. And it's time bound every track yourself. How am I doing? Oh, that month, I just read half a book. Okay, I need to catch up. Next month, I'll finish that book and also do another book. So you can, you know, pace yourself. You can check yourself how you're doing as far as keeping that goal is concerned. And hopefully, as you do that consistently through the year, it's going to have some impact on your spiritual life. I'm sure that if you and I do those kinds of things, Read a good Christian book every month. Now, you can get a little bit more specific. If you have specific areas of your Christian life that you want to build, maybe prayer life, maybe my knowledge about Jesus Christ, maybe my understanding of uh, a particular book in the Bible or a couple of books in the Bible that this year I want to study. So you can be a little bit more specific. And I want to read books on that subject this year. And 
Surely, at the end of the year, if you do that, your prayer life is going to be at a different level. You're going to raise your game as far as your prayer life is concerned. Or you're going to raise your game as far as your understanding of what Jesus Christ is. Or whatever area that you pick. But if you don't have those goals and you just pray, Oh God, at the end of 2018, I want to be stronger spiritually. That's a good prayer to pray. But it's very unlikely it's going to happen. Because you've not done something to pursue that goal through the course of the year. It's a good prayer. But you haven't done anything about it. So, for different areas of, your, of our lives, I didn't call it this, but a spiritual life, for your health, for your, your personal learning, the skills that you need to develop for, the, for your profession and career, whatever you're doing, for your marriage, for the ministry, the church, other areas that you might be interested in, some of you may be interested in writing, so you're going to say, I'm going to write more this year. That's a nice goal, but I mean, that's a nice dream. I'm going to write more, but how about saying, every month, I'm going to write at least one day or whatever you're writing. Something I'm going to do. So you have some, I have a smart goal in order to pursue that dream of writing or uh, whether it's about mentoring people or being involved in missions, whatever. But put it down. Write it. Write down your goals because you can review it to the course of the year. And I'll close with this verse, Cross 40, 23. It says, In all labor there is profit, but idle chapter leads only to if I keep talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking, it's not going to help us. In all labor there is, you've got to put some work towards it. You will see profit. You will see benefit. You will see growth. You will be able to raise your game. By just talking about it, this isn't going to help much. So 2018, raise your game. Ask God for increase. There's nothing wrong. For the various areas of your life, ask God for increase. Second, sharpen your skills. What can you do? And number three, set and pursue smart goals. Go after them. So by the time we finish 2018 this year, all of us will be in a stronger place. Amen? Let's rise to our feet, please. Just apologize for the problems of the sound. I'm not sure what happened today. But we raise our game.
that will take it, multiply it, so that it can be a blessing to people. That we can impact lives, we can touch lives, we can make a difference, God, where you placed us. That we can be salt and light, we can be bearers of the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that each one of us, God, will raise our hand this year, will go up to new levels in whatever we have to do and glorify you through doing that. We pray the grace of God upon our lives to enable us, Father, to do that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Raise again. See you again.